All right, now remember how we did addition, subtraction, multiplication, division of functions in module two? We're going to show you a different way you can combine uh, two or more functions, and that is called composition of functions. So let's take a look. If you have two functions, f of x and g of x, we can form a new function referred to as a composite function by looking at this notation, f composite g of x. This little circle here represents composition of these two functions. So again, remember how I'm reading it, f composite g of x. And how do you evaluate it? By evaluating f of g of x f of g of x. That's how you would read it. So it's almost like thinking of function of a function. You're really looking at function of a function. So you can think of it as how x goes into g function, then g of x goes into the f function. That's what composition really means. x is the input. Input goes into the first function, producing an output. And then once you have this output, this becomes the input for the next function, and then that would be the final output. And I always like comparing this to as if you were traveling from uh, United States to India, which is where I am from. Well, I would go, let's say, from Chicago, for example. I can go from Chicago to somewhere in Europe, and then another plane will take me from Europe to India. So that's how you can think of as composite functions. You are Traveling, your final destination has to be here, but you can't do it at once. So you're traveling with one function and landing here, and then you're using a second function to carry you to your destination. So that's how composite functions can be thought of. What about domain of that function then? Well, let's take a look. Remember, domain of any function is what kind of inputs can you have? So first off, it has to be in the domain of G because otherwise you can't travel with the g function to get the output g of x. So it has to make sense in the g function. But then in addition, the output g of x has to be in the domain of the f function, because otherwise you won't be able to evaluate f of g of x. And so if you really think about what domain of a composite function is, then it should be all x that are in the domain of g of x for which g of x is in the domain of f of x. And then you are OK. When we do more examples, it will become clear to you what we are talking about. What about the range? The range would be whatever is the output. All right, let's take a look at some examples. So let's take a look at f composite g of negative 3, g f composite g of 0, when you have the following functions. We're giving you the function g by giving you some discrete relations between the first set and the second set. And the function f is defined by the following rules between the two sets. So let's take a look at how we can even compute f composite g of negative 3. So our starting point is negative 3. We're starting with negative 3, and the g function is going to carry us to 4. So now we've landed on 4. But now we want to use the f function. So remember, whatever number you're evaluating, the function that sits closest to it is the one that's going to carry you first. So negative 3, we carried g, carried us to 4. Now we're going to use the function f to carry 4 to our destination, which would be the 8. So f composite g of negative 3 is, let's look at that again, negative 3 to 4, 4 to 8, so our output would be 8. So why don't you do f composite g of 0? So you go ahead and evaluate this. Let's pause the video here, and you do it. Oh, come on. Don't just play the video. Do it yourself. It's important. All right. So 0 was carried to 0 for the g function. Then the 0 with the f function went to negative 2. So we are going to have output of negative 2. All right, what about domain then? The domain, you have to look at all the elements in this set here that can be carried all the way to the end here. We already saw negative 3 is in the domain because we went from negative 3 to 4, 4 to 8. What about negative 2? Negative 2 goes to 6. 
uh-oh, 6 cannot be carried by the function f. So 6 is not here, and so that means what? Negative 2 will not be in the domain of the composite function, even though negative 2 is a part of domain of g. What about negative 1? Negative 1 goes to negative 5. Oh, negative 5 is here, so negative 5 goes to 8. So negative 1's ultimate destination would be 8 in the composite function row. What about 0? We already saw 0 goes to 0, 0 goes to negative 2, so negative 2 will be our output. All right, how about um, 2? 2 goes to 6. Uh oh, again, no 6. So, no, 6, 2 is not going to be in our domain either then. So the only things that can be in our domain are negative 3, negative 1, and 0. Negative 2 and 2 both went to 6, and 6 was not carried anywhere with f. All right, how about the range then? The range is the final destination. So let's take a look where we landed. Remember, negative 3 landed on 4, 4 landed on 8. So 8 is definitely in our range. Negative, two, uh, negative 1 landed on negative 5, negative 5 landed on 8. Yep, and 8 was already in our range. Let's see, 0. 0 goes to 0, 0 goes to negative 2. So negative 2 is also in our range. So 8 and negative 2 so far have made it into our range, and 2 is not here, uh, any going anywhere. So that's pretty much it. So negative 2 and 8 is our range. So remember, domain of a composite function, you want to only include numbers that make sense all the way to the end. So you start in G, G carries us somewhere, and then we're going to use F to carry us forward to our destination. And the range is all the output. So let's take a look at f of x is square root x, and g of x is x plus 1. And evaluate f composite g of 3. I will give you a few moments, pause the video, do it on your own, and then you can check your work. Remember, f composite g of 3. So evaluate g of 3 first, and then put that output into input of f, and then see what you get. All right, let's do this together now. 3 goes into g. Here's my g function. So g of 3 would be 3 plus 1, or 4. 4 goes into f. Here's my f function. 4 goes into f would give you square root of 4, which is 2. And so. 2 is the output of f of g of 3. Does that make sense? So go ahead and write that, and that will give you 2 as my output. All right, let's do this. Go ahead and you do that then. You're going to this time start with x. x goes into what function? x will go into g function first. So g of x, which in this case was x plus 1. So that will be my output, which will now become the new input in the x f function. And so f of x plus 1, which will be square root of x plus 1, which will give you the final result of f composite g of x. So f composite g of x would be square root of x plus 1, because you're taking x plus 1 as input for this function here. Does that make sense? So you don't have to write it this way. I'm only doing this in the beginning so that you really understand all the steps. If you already have made sense that, OK, I just take that and I plug it in here, that's exactly what is happening. So now see if you can do the next one. How about g composite f of x? So you go ahead and do that on your own then. Assuming you have done that, it should look, take x, put it into f, which will give you square root x, put square root x into the g function, so you'll get square root x plus 1, and that will be your answer. So look at the difference between these two functions. Here the square root is over the entire x plus 1, Whereas here, the square root is just over the x. And the difference is because what we started with. We started with the f function here, and then put that into g. Here we start with the g function and put that into f. 
Okay, what about domain then of f composite g? So remember what we started with. So domain is going to be all values that we can put into g, and then the result has to go into f. So what kind of values can you plug into g of x? You're doing x plus 1. Well, any real number can be put in and get x plus 1. Then we want to make sure that that real number makes sense in here in the square root. We already know that when you have square roots, what can you not have? You cannot have negative numbers in order to have real numbers. What's the smallest x plus 1 can be? It can be what? Negative 1, because negative 1 plus 1 is 0. So the restriction that we would have to place here is what? That you're going to have x plus 1 would have to be greater equals negative 1, because it has to make sense here. So x plus 1, which is the part inside the root, has to be 0 or more. In other words, x has to be negative 1 to infinity. So that would be the domain of f composite g. Even though domain of g is all real numbers, but not all real numbers can go forward into this function here. I hope that makes sense. Otherwise, rewind and watch this again. Or let's look at domain of g composite f of x. What do you think we should do? So that would be this function here. So you're starting with this function. So you're already starting with 0 to infinity numbers. Then you're putting it in here. So what will happen then? Well, you're going to have all non-negative real numbers. When you take square root of that, you're still going to get OK numbers because you can take square root of real numbers greater or equal 0. And then you're just adding a 1 to it. So 0 to infinity will be our domain there. 